If you want to learn the best way to build a sales team from scratch, then I want to show you this presentation I gave a little bit ago in front of a room of 100 entrepreneurs on how to recruit, hire, train, and manage outbound and inbound sales teams. Enjoy. All right. So our uh, last person who is going to share with you today is somebody who has been uh, very helpful to us in uh, the sales department. He's also helped build uh, Tony Robbins sales teams. He's helped build Dean Graciosi's, Frank Kearns, and a whole bunch of others. That's really what he does. And um, he came from a background of being a high-ticket salesperson and sold uh, a ridiculous amount on his own and then realized that he'd built a lot of great systems. And one of the things that we found we needed, we tried bringing sales in-house. We hired several salespeople. It just never worked out. Um, so we needed a system for doing that, and Cole has develop that and um, he's going to share with you how he does that. Let's give him a hand. Thank you, brother. All right. Let's throw up the slides here. Who has a sales team in the room? Just raise your hands. Okay, so this will be relevant to all of you guys. And then also on top of that, if you don't have a sales team, this is still going to be relevant because what I found is like I was a sales lead for a company selling high ticket before I actually started my company. And I believe, probably with the exception of like, you know, building a development team or a data team or something like that, but at least in the high ticket model, I believe the sales team is the hardest. So a lot of the lessons I'm gonna share with you in this presentation is gonna to apply to all your teams, not just sales. But uh, what we're gonna talk about is automatic selling, so how we built our sales floor to two and a half million a month cash in two years, and then how we've done that for, uh, or replicated that process for 700 plus clients. The reason I titled it automatic is probably nobody here like wants to be a full-time sales manager for their business. You know, you want to get to a point to where you can actually have your sales team as an asset that essentially produces you cash flow independent of your time. So that's what I've been able to do and that's what I'm going to share. So what we're going to cover is the essential foundations to building a sales team, uh, where to find your stars and superstars, and what's the difference between stars and superstars in sales, ramping the sales reps from zero to KPI, so there's like a 28-day process we're going to break down each, each week. And then uh, the last thing we're gonna talk about is culture. So first, just a quick introduction. Um, a lot of you guys know me here, but my name's Cole Gordon. I own Closures.io. So essentially, we are um, kind of the, the, the like category king, if you will, of building teams internally, right? So we do staffing and training. We don't necessarily do like pure done-for-you outsource. That's something like Randall I was talking to earlier. That's what he does. He's more the person you go to when you outsource. We're all about when you wanna build in-house. Okay, but um, obviously it wasn't always that way. When I started in sales, I was probably the worst salesperson in existence. And even when I built my first sales team, I was pretty bad at that too. And the reason I tell you that is that with sales and sales teams, a lot of folks ascribe their identity to it. They're like, I'm just not a good salesperson or I'm just not the sales trainer you are. And just like anything, it's a skill you can learn. You know, it's a hard skill, but it's a skill you can learn. That's what we're gonna talk about. So we worked with a bunch of people, you guys probably know. Um, I'm gonna skip through this because it's like the social proof section. And most importantly, um, we're really one of the only sales recruiters who's actually done what we're helping clients do. So, you know, like I just said, our sales team, um, you know, we've been kind of plateaued about two and a half million a month for like seven months, but we're doing two and a half million a month sales, 48% profit margins. Not like basically none of our competitors are doing that, uh, not even close. So what we're gonna do is take all of that experience working with all of those clients and doing it ourselves and then package it down into three keys to sales team success. But before we do that, what we're gonna do is spend two minutes on the foundations you need to have before that. So. There's two parts to a winning sales team. There's the people and there's the vehicle. So think of the people as like the talent, okay? And then the vehicle is the system the talent operates within. All right, so like I always use a NASCAR example, even though NASCAR is fake and it's scripted. But um, the, the people is essentially like the driver. The vehicle is the car it's driving. So Dale Earnhardt Jr. might be you know, amazing, but if he's driving a Honda Civic, he's not gonna win the Daytona 500. So the vehicle is also what gives you the power in the recruiting marketplace. So everybody here is a really good marketer, and you guys know the most important thing for your marketing campaign is what? It's the offer that you're making. And the better the offer is, the easier it is to get the prospects that you want. Well, in sales, and really recruiting in general, the better you can make working for your company is the opportunity, the better sales people that you're gonna get. So how do you create a great vehicle or a great opportunity? Uh, first of all, you wanna have a validated offer. Probably everybody here has that. Like, if you have a high ticket offer, have you sold it uh, a dozen times? Is there like a decent sales process, et cetera? But the second thing is what I call the optimal selling system, which I stole from Mark Ford. Have you guys read uh, Ready, Fire, Aim? 
I read that book more than any other book that I've ever read. Super good. So um, the high ticket kind of uh, version of that is essentially one, a consistent, repeatable way to generate leads, okay, sales calls. And um, you guys probably know Alex Ramosi. He talks about the six ways to generate leads. There's own media, earned media, referrals and word of mouth, affiliates, paid traffic, and um, cold outbound. We particularly do paid traffic really well. We also have like an outbound cold calling team, like to cold calling people who've like never heard of us. Uh, you could certainly do it through own, me or, uh, own media or earned media as well. I would say 98% of my clients, they all do paid traffic. So a lot of times that's a great requisite, validating that before you start staffing your team, okay? The second thing is a consistent, repeatable sales process. So you wanna do that in a way that eliminates what's called founder syndrome. So who here, you just gotta be honest, has ever thought like, man, my thing is so complex or advanced that only I can sell my product, <laughs> right? That's one of the things uh, Simon is a, is a genius at helping people with, is developing models so you can sell your product consistently. Well, um, I call that founder syndrome. So you have to have, like what you wanna do with your optimal selling system is build like a conveyor belt, okay? So it's like the leads are coming in the same way with the same context, through the same funnel, and you're using the same diagnostic and prescriptive process to enroll those people into your services every single time. So it's very, very easy when you yourself or your sales integrator, you're starting and you're the one selling in the beginning, and essentially it's like you're the one in the conveyor belt, then when we go to hire the sales reps, we just take you out and put two people in. Okay, that makes it much easier than uh, doing, you know, like a great example of something that doesn't work as well with sales teams is if you do a bunch of events, okay? That can help and can be a good spike in sales, but it gives your sales team no regularity if all their stuff is like two events a year. Or if you do like a challenge or two challenges a year, you have to have some sort of kind of evergreen funnel to back your sales team, okay? Now, once you have a good optimal selling system, essentially what you could do is you could find your on-track earnings. So your on-track earnings is essentially just what the salesperson can make throughout the year, right? So if they hit based on, um, so it's based on three things. The comp structure, your closing rate as established by either you or the sales integrator, and then also the opportunity volume um, available to the salesperson. So those three things determine the on-track earnings. So the on-track earnings, and then also the other thing in terms of creating a great vehicle is your mission, vision, and values. So for me, when I started, like, you know, when I had probably like 10 people, I thought the whole mission, vision, and values thing, I was like, this is like, whatever. You know, now that I have 100 people, it's huge. Because if you guys have a big organization, you know that eventually you get to this point where there's so much entropy. It's like everything, you know, you just have so many people, so many people are going in different directions. If you have great mission, vision, and values, that's what really gets people into alignment. And it's almost like the sales letter for your recruiting department, okay? So that's a big thing we talk about as well. So with that in place, let's go into the first key of uh, sales team success, that's building your recruiting pipeline. So key points, we're gonna talk about who you're going after, how to build volume in the pipeline, and then how to filter the good people from the bad people. You know, if you've hired a salesperson, you've probably been through an experience where this, you think you're hiring this like stud, and then they can't even close the barn door, right? So we're gonna start with who, okay? Very, very similar to building like a marketing funnel. So who are we going after? We wanna look for three things. Number one is specialized knowledge. So Naval Ravikant says specialized knowledge is the knowledge that only comes from the experience of doing. So you can't learn it in a textbook, you can't learn it in a course, it only comes from actually in the trenches experience. So this is like their track record, all right? Um, obviously this kind of sounds obvious, but like the best predictor of future behavior is, is past behavior. The next thing which is not talked about as much is industry acumen, okay? This is if they can speak the actual language in your industry. So I have a client who, uh, she helps women over 40 uh, with like a nutritional protocol, help with their hormones and all this different type of stuff. If I took a, a car sales guy who is just a savage, right? He has the specialized knowledge, but then he goes and tries to sell that offer, is he gonna be successful? No, no right? Because he can't speak the language, okay? So it's like almost like that tribal mentality. You want somebody who understands the industry and understands the acumen so that there's like a relate, like they can actually relate to the market. That is very, very big and oftentimes with my company, like we're really great at sales training, so I know I can download the skill sets into them. I would rather have somebody who can speak to my market and understand my industry, okay? Then the last thing is buy-in, all right? Buy-in to the, uh, the mission, vision, and values and product. I always think of vision as like where we're going, mission is why we're going where we're going, and then the values is how we're gonna conduct ourselves on the journey to going where we're going. 
Okay? So the biggest thing that we have to have that's non-negotiable is obviously buy-in. Right? If they're not, you know, they could be great, but if they're not going to align with the mission, vision, and values, they're obviously not going to be on the team. So most desirable to least desirable recruits. The best is obviously you want all three. Okay? If you can find somebody who has a specialized knowledge, they can speak the language of your industry, and they're bought into what you're doing, obviously that person's going to be good. Now, those people can be pretty hard to find. So what we want second, or tied for second, is somebody with two of the three criteria. So buy-in's non-negotiable, and then we either want them to have experience, but we got to teach them the industry, or we want them to uh, know the industry really well, but we got to download the sales skill set into them. Okay? That's usually for my company pretty much the sweet spot of where we get our volume, if that makes sense. Okay? Like our best person, um, she didn't know anything about the industry, but she was really good in solar sales. Then we have another person who's really, really good, and that was a previous coach for us who really understood the industry, but had never done sales, and they wanted to make more money. So you see how that two out of the three. Okay? So our last would be, and this would be like maybe if you're hiring an SDR, like an entry level role or something like that, you could have somebody who just has like the character traits, the hunger, the buy-in, but no real acumen and experience. Okay? But obviously that's not ideal. Uh, again, buy-in is non-negotiable. For, for top tier positions, we want two of three. Uh, if it's super entry level, maybe we can settle for buy-in, but obviously um, that's not as ideal. So how do you build recruiting uh, or volume in your recruiting pipeline? So when I was making this presentation for you guys, um, I, I really wanted to like, you know, I know people like love funnels. So I was like going to be like, you need this amount of applications and it goes to this amount of interviews. But as I started to look through like the seven to eight sources that we get people, what I realized is that the volume you need is highly predicated on the way that you're sourcing the people. Okay? So for instance, the number one high quality source is referrals from excellent salespeople in your industry. So you should re remember this phrase, good salespeople know other good salespeople. Like the whole reason I started my company is because I was a great salesperson and I started doing a little sales coaching and literally I was getting asked every other day, I'm, I'm not even kidding, do you know where I can find good salespeople? Like do you have any good salespeople? So that's like literally why I started a sales recruiting company. Okay? So if you need referrals, you might only need one person, but if you're running Indeed, you're going to need like 500 applications, you know, to find one person. Okay? So I put here like, you know, is it somebody who's a referral from a Cutco's top sales rep or um, is it, you know, somebody from Indeed? That's going to basically dictate the volume. One thing I will say is if you've never hired sales reps before, and this goes for really any position, what I would recommend is interviewing at least 20 people, which I know that sounds like a lot, but 20 people before you make a hire. Because the human brain can only understand what's good and what's bad through comparison, right? You only understand what light is if you know what dark is. So if you hire 20 people, you'll start to really get into a rhythm of like who is actually a stud. If you hire three, you're kind of just leaving it up to chance. Or if you interview three, you're leaving it up to chance. The best way to do this, which we're going to talk about in a second, is through group interviews, which works really great with sales, but also works with pretty much every position. So. Best to worst sources, um, this is my opinion, and this is also given you're not going to use a recruiter like my company. But um, num number one is referrals from salespeople in your industry. Obviously, if you're getting a referral from a great salesperson in your industry, you're going to get all three, three criteria, right? After that would be a referral from somebody who's in sales, not in your industry. Then after that, we'll tell clients to use like referrals just from their clients, peers, et cetera. I know referrals sounds like the most basic way to recruit ever, but you would just be so surprised how little people really leverage referrals. Like if you're looking for a position, one time I was hiring a COO, I just went into Facebook Messenger and I literally looked at my past like 500 messages and anybody who I thought might know somebody, I just asked them. And I found like, I probably had like 30 interviews lined up. So uh, don't underestimate referrals. Obviously your client group audience list. And then after all of that, which is kind of like your warm network, uh, outbound via LinkedIn, you can go after people in your industry using LinkedIn Recruiter, or you can outbound people like who work for maybe like HubSpot or outbound people who work for like Cutco or Southwestern, those are good door-to-door -door companies. And then finally, I would use job boards or paid traffic. Job boards and paid traffic can use, uh, you, or they can work. The problem is you gotta have systems to handle a lot of scale, okay? Because you're gonna get hundreds and hundreds of applications, and the majority of them just aren't gonna be very good. So. You need less volume near the top and then more volume or uh, more volume near the bottom. So what does the interview process look like? Now I'm going to show you how I, how I interview sales reps, but what I'll say is this will work for basically any position and it's going to be super valuable, okay? So first of all, we start with an application that's pretty basic. Then if it's kind of iffy, 
We'll move to a video application. So you guys probably know like Video Ask or like, a, you know, we'll just have them send in a Loom video. That way we can get an idea of like their energy. And then after that, we do a group interview. This was one of the biggest game changers that we use internally for our recruiting is essentially we approve a bunch of people on group interviews. So we'll do like, um, let's just say two group interviews a week, uh, 10 people a group interview. Now we're interviewing at least 80 people a month for a position. So you see how that scales so fast. So what we'll do is we'll get them on a group interview and then you pretty much just run it like a normal interview. So a few things. Um, you, I would, you know, a lot of the questions you ask on group, they're super basic. So like, what prompted you to reach out about the position? What, what's relevant about your you know, past job experience? How'd you reach out? The big thing is, is you wanna leave the questions open-ended. So don't say like, okay, John, you start. Susan, you start. You just see who goes first, okay? And then what's gonna be key is you'll see who copies the leader's answers versus who is actually original, okay? And then also a fun tip. You gotta make this one fun or it's a little weird. But at the end, we always ask, uh, so you can't, like, we're like, have fun with this question, but you can't say yourself. But if you were me, who on this interview would you hire and you can't say yourself? And they always all pick the best person. <laughs> so you gotta make these fun. Like, you, you gotta have good energy on it. It's not like you're like pitting them all against each other. But the big thing is, is especially if you do this on Zoom and you have gallery view, you can just so easily see within five minutes who the A players are. And then you take the three out of the 10, and then you move them to a one-on-one -on -one screening interview, which is the next one. And you can do this for uh, any position. Like we, I, I learned this from Cameron Harold, and he said he was using it for like COOs and executives. So just don't think it's just for sales. Uh, so we do a screening interview, then after that we do a mock triage call. So that's like a 15 minute inbound call where they like pretend to set me. And then we do a scorecard interview, and we kind of follow like the who model. So we do a scorecard, and we basically get agreements on all of their KPIs. Okay, so in terms of how to interview, remember, we're looking for specialized knowledge, industry acumen, and buy-in. So how do we actually elicit that? So my process, we'll do an introduction. So that's very basic. It's like, what prompted you to reach out about the role? Uh, you know, what stuck out to you, et cetera. Then we'll go into work history, also relatively basic. So I just look at their last three positions, and then I'm trying to see, do they have this upward spiral of momentum? You know, as you guys know, you don't want to look for downward moves. You want to look for at least lateral, but preferably upward moves. And you always want to be asking why they left each position to go to the next position, okay? And also, like, what they achieved, what they actually accomplished. I always chunk down to their actual sales numbers. I want to know, like, how much commissions did they make? What was their close rate? Because good salespeople don't know that stuff. And then we go on to competency-based questions. So a lot of people, I bet, in this room ask situational-based questions. So that's essentially like, so, you know, let's say you're hiring a marketing director. It's like, okay, well, you know, if we hire you on and then we onboard you like this, what would be your game plan in the next 90 days? Okay? That's a situational-based question. The problem with situational-based questions is it's assuming that they're actually going to be able to do what they say. Okay? It's very easy to just say all the right things. So competency-based questions are not based on what they're projecting out, but they're based on what they're actually already have done. Okay, like Charlie Munger says, like he never looks at the manager and CEOs he's hiring forecasted projections, he always looks at their track record. Okay, so all these competency-based questions, they always start with the phrase, tell me a specific time when. So we'll go through some examples in a second. Then we do inputs. So your inputs equal your outputs. All right, so like if you, for instance, if you wanna be like a bodybuilder, wanna look really good, obviously what you put in your body, your sleep, your nutrition, that makes a difference. Well, in business, in my experience, what you read, what you consume, who's trained you, who's influenced you, that dictates how you're going to perform in your outputs. So we'll go through some questions there, but I basically ask, like who's been their biggest influence in sales? What's influencer selling style the most? What programs or coaching have they bought? What's their favorite sales books? Right? A great salesperson, you ask, what's your favorite sales book? So he'll like shuffling over to the bookshelf and they'll be like, bam, 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 and they'll tell you why those are good. A bad salesperson, they'll be like, uh, straight line selling. That's my favorite. <laughs> Wolf of Wall Street. Um, so your inputs. <laughs> attitude, uh, so then we assess attitude. So what we wanna do is assess internal versus external locus of control. So that means like, do they, are they like a victim or do they have agency? Okay, I'll show you some questions for that. Then we assess career fit. So here's some really good interview questions. And again, you guys can use like morph these for anything you want to, okay, not just sales. So work history. The biggest thing with work history, right, is a aside from just like what they've uh, 
done in the past and just like what their actual numbers are and their accomplishments, you want to know why they left each position. So now, here's the thing. Most people, when they do anything, they have the reason that sounds good <laughs> and then the real reason, right? It's like the reason that, sound, like the, the, you know, they're going to give you at this event and then also you have like five beers with them and then they tell you the real reason, okay? How do you get the real reason on an interview? You say, hmm. So after they tell you uh, why they left X, Y, and Z position, and they're like, okay, you know, they, they tell you the, the reason that sounds good, you say, hmm, well, I uh, guess that makes sense. Um, is there any other reason you wanted to leave, though? So that's called the any other reason question, okay? So you ask this question, and they'll be like, I just hated my boss, you know? They'll, they'll actually give you the real reason, okay? So I got this from sales. Because uh, when you're trying to find why now in sales, a lot of times they don't give you the real reason. And the any other reason question actually gives them the real truth of why they actually want to make the change they say they want to make. Okay? So some CBBI questions. This is not an exhaustive list. I just pulled out some, uh, some examples so you could see like throughout the process a good examples here and there. So CBBI questions. Tell me about the last two deals you won to an extreme proactive sales effort. Walk me through the deal end to end, step by step. What happened? Okay. Do you see how nobody can fake that question, right? But like, what people will want to do is they'll say, OK, like, sell me this pen. Don't say that. If you say, sell me this pen on a sales interview, I will, I will be really upset with you. Please, don't say that. Like a good salesperson, they're, they're going to be like, I'm not working for this person. So, uh, but like, they might say, how would you handle a financial objection? Well, just because they can role play it with you doesn't mean they've actually done it. So you want to hear like stories of what they've actually done. Now the key is, a lot of people when you ask CBBI questions, what they'll say is, well generally, when I'm really trying to get a deal across the line, I do blank, blank, and blank. Do you see how they just avoided telling you an actual specific story? So you cut them off and then you reorient them to it. Does that make sense? Okay. You can do uh, competency-based interview questions. I got this uh, from, I think, I don't know, I, I read like, like a couple dozen interview books and then built a process out of it you know, a couple years ago. So it's competency-based behavioral interview questions, I think was what it's called. Um, OK, this is a good one, too. Were there times at XYZ company where Leaflow wasn't up to par? So you ask that to a salesperson, oh, yeah, like every, every other month. <laughs> oh, OK, well, well, give me an example. Tell me about that. Got it. OK, well, tell me about the specific actions you took during that month when Leaflow was down to still hit your numbers despite not having the Leaflow you felt was sufficient. So you see how I teed them up into that, right? OK. Uh, I, uh, I, I took a coach through this recently that we hired for our company. And he was like, after I took him through this, he was like, man, I can tell by the way you interview people, like everybody on your team is eight players. OK? Because you can't fake this stuff. Uh, you got another good one. What was your worst performing month at X, Y, and Z company? How many units did you sell? How does that compare to your best month? Wow. That's like 50% of your potential. So tell me specifically. Like, what did you learn during that experience? OK, and that was in the month of May, correct? How did you bounce back in June? Right? So you see how like, they, they can't fake any of this. OK? So inputs. This is like, I mean, this stuff I kind of already told you. So describe to me your sales philosophy. Like, what's been your biggest influence? Uh, what are your favorite books? What did you like about that book? Uh, I mean, this is like basic stuff. But if you have somebody who's invested 10K in themselves to learn sales, you know, hopefully for me, but uh, if not, <laughs> Uh, you know, it's, it's, it, it makes a huge difference. Like, we've measured this, and people who have stuff where they're like, oh, yeah, I bought an Eli Wilde's program or Cole's program, they, they're usually way better. Okay? Attitude, right? This is a good one. So, uh, when I call your previous sales manager, um, what do you think they'll tell me your biggest strengths were? And you kind of get them talking, right? They like to talk about their strengths. So this is going to be a nice pace, pace lead here. What do you think your biggest strengths were? OK, and then they'll say, oh, like I'm, I'm, I have great follow through. So they give you these vague things. You always want to say, gotcha, can you tell me a specific time where you had really strong follow through? Like, give me an example. So you always chunk it down. All right? And then I say, OK, when I speak with them in the same conversation, what would you say is like maybe your two biggest opportunities to improve that they're going to share with me? Right? I kind of soften it. What do you say is maybe like your, your, your two biggest opportunities to improve? OK, so you get both of the two opportunities, and then you say, OK, and how long ago was it that you got that feedback? OK, well, tell me the specific steps that you took in the last two years since you gotten that feedback to be able to improve on those two things specifically. OK? Yeah, well, like, and by the way, like, 
I know like a lot of you guys will take this and then it's like, man, I can't hire anybody. <laughs> Nobody can make it through this. Yeah, so this is like, you know, obviously if it's like entry level, you're gonna have to kinda, kinda like, you know, take it down a notch. But I wanted to give you guys some of the good stuff, okay? But if I hire like an executive, they're going through this for sure. All right, uh, career fit. So this is another good one. What's your goal in the next five years? Where do you see yourself? Uh, okay, what other goals do you have? Professionally, listen, listen for me. What about outside of work? What are your personal goals that you set for yourself? So I kind of like just, blah, like just get them to like vomit all their goals out for me. And I say, gotcha. So you mentioned blank, right? Maybe they say like, like a great example is like, oh, I want to speak on stage. I want to write books. I want to do this. And it's like, okay, great. Well, um, how do you see yourself being a salesperson as the bridge to be able to get to that goal? So career fit is really like with your prospects, you're selling them on being the bridge between the current desired situation. With your employees, is it the bridge between their current desired situation or are they trying to win the interview? Because humans opti optimize for optionality. They just want the option. But then they're two weeks in, you wasted a bunch of time and they bounce. Okay? You really want to know, like, is this the stepping stone they're getting to where they want to go or are they just kind of telling you what you want to hear? So that's very, very good. Um, also on the personal goals, you'll say, so you mentioned like insert personal goal. You, you, you mentioned really being present with your family. What specific steps in the last 90 days have you taken to, taken to doing that better or hitting that goal? So I asked this to a coach um, and he was like, man, I'm really trying to lose weight. I said, okay, dude, you're really trying to lose weight. What specific steps in the last 90 days have you taken to move closer to that outcome? And he said, dude, in the last six months, I've lost 70 pounds. I was like, my man. You got through it. Okay, so that's how you interview. Now, if anybody makes it through that process, you're gonna have to ramp them. So, uh, <laughs> ramping sales reps. So the rule of two, okay? The rule of two is we always hire two, uh, especially when it's your first hire. So again, remember we created the optimal selling system. It's like a conveyor belt, okay? You might be the one selling or your sales integrator, your sales manager is gonna be the one selling, okay? Now when you hire your first two reps, you wanna take that person out, put two people in. You want to do that, why? We've already talked about it twice, comparison. Because if they both stink, it could be you not ramping them right, or it could be something with the leads. But if one's good and one stinks, then you just cut the one that stinks. Or if they're both really good, now you've got two good salespeople. So you always hire two, especially in the beginning. It's very, very hard for a new, like, for, you know, you're building your sales team the first time. Very, very hard for you to understand kind of like the difference between a good salesperson and a bad salesperson, only if you hire one. Okay? Now, most everybody here has probably done some sort of like group coaching program, right? So you probably know when you do that and you launch it as like a beta and then you make the program with the, uh, with the students, okay? That's kind of what you want to do when you hire your first salespeople. It's like you bring on your first two salespeople and then for a week you just meet with them every day and you basically run them through the entire sales playbook, record it all, and then you put it in your LMS, okay? So you just think about it like a group coaching. And, and, and again, do this the first time, because if you don't do it the first time, you're really gonna hate yourself for not doing it the first time, because you're gonna have to do it all over again, and then you're gonna really hate ramping people. Okay, so what's in the sales playbook? So there's two types of onboarding. There's company-specific onboarding and role-specific onboarding. Company-specific is the onboarding everybody goes through no matter what. Role-specific breaks down, it's really for the specific role. So this would just be for the setter, or just for the closer. Now within role-specific, there's general, beginning of day, middle of day, end of day. Okay, general is like the dialer they need, the other software, uh, meetings, like, the pro like educating on the product, having them go through all of the testimonials. All your salespeople should go through all of the testimonials to basically like really get that conviction up that what you're selling is great, okay? Then we have a, what's called a beginning day of process or beginning, beginning of day process. That's knowing how to show up and conduct themselves on the meetings. So as you'll see, I'm huge on meetings, okay? And, and the morning meeting is the most important part of your sales team. We're gonna talk about why that is later, but they have, we have like a whole SOP in terms of how to show up to the meeting, okay? Uh, middle of day process. So the great thing about sales, and, and the reason I started in sales uh, after you know, I, I basically failed as, as an entrepreneur, is there's only really two things that matter. Getting on calls and then conducting the calls, that's it. So knowing that to be true, we can really break down all of the sales uh, SOPs into those two things. The things you're doing on the call with a prospect, and then if you're not on a call, 
the things you're doing to try to get on a call. So when it comes to being on the call, there's really only a couple situations. It's either you made an outbound call and they answered, you're having a 15 minute triage, or you're having a 60 minute consult. Or if you have like a two step uh, process, maybe it's like a you know, call one, call two. So pretty basic. So what you would wanna do is if you were the sales integrator or you, you wanna have your sales integrator uh, basically put together like 20 call recordings as well as your script, as well as like your sales philosophy, et cetera, put that in your LMS, that's your on the call SOPs. Your off the call SOPs is how they actually prospect and generate leads. So this could be your outbound process, this could be essentially, uh, maybe you do like chat messaging, your Instagram messaging, you wanna have all of that systematized into like SOPs and trainings, and the same way you would teach that to a client, you wanna teach it in your LMS to the salespeople. Best way to do it again is live first, record it all, then add it to your Kajabi or whatever LMS you're using. Now we have end of day process. So for those of you with a sales team, do your salespeople like admin? They love it, they love admin. They love entering all the information in the HubSpot. They just love it. Sarcasm. Um, no, they hate it. So what, what I found to do is you want to create a checklist at the end of the day for them to do all of their admin and batch it all at once within 20 minutes. Okay? This is really subtle. But if they don't do this, what they're going to do instead of prospect, like let's say they have a no-show. Okay? What you want them to do when they have a no-show is you want them to prospect or hit their pipeline. Now, most salespeople won't do that. Part of it's a culture issue. Another part of it is they're like trying to get ahead on their admin before the day's over so that when they have that last call, they can bounce, okay? So when you make the end of day checklist and you tell them they're not supposed to do it till the end of the day, now they can't proactively do their admin and if they have a no-show, they prospect or they hit pipeline, okay? Very, very small distinction. I would only know to create that as a process if because I was a salesperson, because I was trying to do my admin proactively before the day. So we have that and then we also have an end of day qualitative report where they basically submit in Slack all of their consults, what happened, what was great, where could they improve, and what are the next steps. And we want three to four detailed sentences where we can scan that. All of the ones that aren't good, we pull those and then we review those on tomorrow's sales meeting. Okay, we do a call review. So to create your playbook, you map all this stuff out, you take them through it like a group coaching program basically. Okay, so here's the timeline. First seven days, three one-on-ones with the direct report, you take them through all the onboarding, they consume the, uh, the training, the sales uh, call library. They shadow one person, okay, very big. Do not have them, yeah, man, spend a day with Susan, spend a day with Kevin, then spend a day with James. You're going to get the most confused salesperson in the world. You're going to be like, I, they're, they're going to be so confused. So you either you take the top person or preferably you just have the manager do it, okay? I would only have your top person do it if like you are managing the sales team yourself and you were just like unbelievably strapped, then just do that. Otherwise, the manager should train everybody, okay? Very, very big. It's one of the most highest leverage things a manager can do. Uh, they're gonna attend the daily sales meetings in the first seven days, we'll talk about those. And they're also gonna do daily role plays with their team members, okay? Um, second seven days. So if they're outbound or they're end to end, end to end means like, they're a closer, but they only generate their own leads, okay? Inbound is like they, they get calls booked under the calendar from setters or ads. If they're outbound or end to end, we just let them loose. It's like your second week, man, go out there, go get them. Inbound closer is what we do because there's opportunity costs, right? I don't want to spend a bunch of money on this closer if they're going to stink. So we just give them half volume. So that's typically going to be two to three sales calls a day. And what we want to do is we just want to have a very, very, very tight feedback loop with them, okay? Very, very tight. And then we'll continue doing all the training listed on the week before. So we'll do the one-on-ones, daily meetings, call reviews, et cetera. Um, you're gonna want to, yeah. So you're gonna wanna review at least one to two calls a day or have your sales manager do that so they can see how they sound, okay? Big, big thing. So when I used to do call reviews with my sales team, I don't manage my sales team anymore, but when I used to, I would do a call review and I would like decimate them. I would give them like 100 things they need to do to get better. What I learned is that does not help. What you need to do is you need to give them one piece of feedback, one, right? It's like uh, Mark Robert says, um, he's the guy who built HubSpot sales team. It's like if you're, you're taking a golf lesson, you don't want to like be, it's like turn your wrist this way, bend your knees, bend your back, do this. And it's like, you're, you're just so stiff as a board, you can't do anything. They give you one piece of feedback that let, they let you swing 50 times. Very, very similar to sales. It's very, very hard to do because you're going to hear the calls. You're going to be like, oh my God, like change everything. Uh, now, if you have chat setters, right, or like chat emailers, um, people doing Facebook Messenger, Facebook groups, 
anything that's over chat, okay? How do you QC chat? What you do is you have them do a soundless Loom video to where they go through all their chat conversations of the previous day, and soundless, they just scroll through, and then you, you review that on the next sales meeting, almost like you would review a call review and you critique their chat. Soundless, okay? The first, I, I guarantee, like the first time you'll tell your setters to do this, they will make, make a 40 minute video narrating like exactly why they use this emoji and like, you know, everything. And it just, it, it takes, you have to have them redo it. So soundless, okay? Um, with half volume, they're essentially gonna get about eight to 12 calls that week, right? Three times five maybe 15, 15 total calls with show rate, probably gonna fall uh, eight to 12. Based on your close rate, if you're, you're rocking like a 25 to 30% close rate, um, typically, you should see them close at least one. Now, if they don't close one, uh, that doesn't mean just fire them immediately, okay? Especially if you're new to building a sales team. It, it just means like you need to really, you know, keep tabs on them. It could mean you need to fire them immediately. We're gonna talk about how to fire. Um, but if you're new to salespeople or you're new to training salespeople, you want to give yourself a little grace because you might not be a great manager either. So you might want to give them a little bit longer. Now, as you get more experienced, like usually I just can let people go in the first week. I can just tell. Okay. So day 14 to day 28, this is going to be a full week of volume. And essentially it's going to determine um, if they're going to work out or not. Like we should know pretty much within, this, within the third week here, if not the fourth week, if it's, they're going to make it or not. Okay. So when do you fire them? So we assess in two ways. There's qualitative and quantitative measurement. Now, why not just do quantitatively? You know, why can't we optimize our sales team like we optimize our funnel? Okay, because of regression to the mean. So you need about 50 calls, and I don't even, I think it's probably more than 50, but technically at least 50 to get um, a statistically significant number in terms of what their actual closing rate is. Because obviously, like with anything, with, with statistics, there's like a variance, okay? So you don't wanna have like somebody catch a downswing and then you just let them go and they would've actually been really good. So you have to give them like 50 to see if they're good. Now the problem is, if your calls are like 400 bucks a piece like mine, I don't really wanna give them 50. I'm like, that's, that's a lot. So because of that, we do look at the numbers. We look at quantitative, but we also look at qualitative, right? And that's how we make the faster decisions. So, um, and, and a great example too is like, I, I remember when I was in sales, I would, I would have 10 calls, get basically 10 no's in a row, then my next 10 calls I close eight. Like stuff like that happens all the time. There's just natural ebbs and flows. So that is why you do need to give them a long cycle of calls, but at the same time, to make sure you don't blow your budget, you need to make sure you do qualitative measurement as well. So what are the quantitative benchmarks? Qualitative is gonna be next. So within 10 calls, I wanna see them at least close one or like, if not, they're sounding really good, okay? 20 live calls, and this is again, live calls, like show ups. 20 live calls, at least, let's say your closing rate's like 25% uh, baseline, at least a 10 to 15% trending towards KPI and coachable taking feedback. 30 to 40 live calls, hopefully at KPI, and I put 20% here, it really depends on the offer, like for us, it's like 30, but um, I have a company that does, you know, two and a half million a month as an agency, and theirs is 10 because they sell these huge companies. It just, you know, it's, that's just what theirs is. Um, and if they're not near KPI, it's gonna be a strong trend. And you also want their calls to be sounding good, coachable taking feedback. Like 30 to 40 calls, you should be like, if they're not there, you should be like, man, this guy's really good. He's sounding really good. I just think it's like a little bit of variance. 50 calls is judgment day. You know, if we get to 50 calls and they're not there, then you know, it's just probably not gonna work out. Now there's only three reasons why they don't work out. This will help you self-diagnose. It's either you didn't give them sufficient feedback, um, they're not coachable or implementing the feedback, or you're trying to turn a two uh, into a 10, opposed to like an eight into a 10. Does that make sense? So either like you, you didn't really train them, and that does happen sometimes with people, or like they're not coachable. Okay, a lot of sales people who've been doing it for like 20 years, they think they're really good, they're not coachable. The final thing, and this happens a lot of times, where you really like the person, they're a culture fit, Right, it would be like a top left person in uh, Richard, and, uh, Richard and Ryan's presentation. It's like, man, they're just such a culture fit. Like, they're awesome, they're really trying hard. But the, at the end of the day, skill set wise, they're like a two, and you needed them to be like an eight. Like, you want to take an eight to a 10, not a two to a 10. There's too much of a gap. Does it make sense? Cool. Uh, 
feel like people have probably been through that one before. Now, qualitative. So again, during that 50 call process, we don't want to wait 50 calls if we can fire them earlier and we know they're not going to work out. So what are the qualitative benchmarks we ask ourselves? How are they showing up to meetings? It's a big thing. We're going to talk about meetings in a second. Um, are they proactive with figuring out why they're not hitting their numbers? Like if a, sales, a good salesperson, if they're not hitting their numbers, they're going to be freaking mad. They're going to be pissed off. They're going to be asking questions. They're going to be hungry. They're going to be like, dude, review this call. I'm so frustrated about this. That's what you want. Okay? You want that hunger. Uh, so are they pissed, hungry? Are they asking questions? If they're not asking questions, really bad sign, especially if they're not hitting their numbers. Uh, obviously, like, how does their recording sound? So if you're listening to the recordings, like, you'll, you'll kind of know after a time, you're like, this sounds really good. You know, their, their numbers aren't there, but this person sounds good. Trust your gut then. Okay? But, like, there's some times, there was a time where, uh, this is very, very early on, where I hired a salesperson, I listened to his second call, let him go. It just wasn't going to, he was a two. I could tell right there. Like, he's, he's so far off the mark that this is not going to work out. Um, and then also what's your gut say about him? So when to fire, bottom line, I would always look at the quantitative first, and then if anything is off, then you want to look into qualitative, okay? And then follow your gut based on those questions, okay? And if you're newer, maybe give yourself a little bit more time. So key three is sales, leadership, and culture. So a sales team can only perform at the level in which it's led, right? A big reason for this is sales teams run off inspiration, right? Think about like sports, like it's very, very similar to like a sports team, okay? And a salesperson is also the only person in your company that cannot perform if not inspired. So your accountant could hate you. Your accountant could like be miserable and like have no energy and be depressed. They could probably still nail your books, theoretically. But if your salesperson doesn't have conviction and they're not inspired, I guarantee they're not going to sell anything. Okay? So you have to get energy in to get energy out of the sales team. It's not like a funnel, unfortunately. Um, so what does a, sale, a good sales manager do? Recruits, hire, onboards, trains, wraps, stuff. Um, stays in sync with the leadership and the marketing team so the company can hit monthly and quarterly projections. So we'll talk about this, but essentially what you want to do is you want to have all your sales team set projections, okay? And they're always usually going to overshoot a little bit. Then you take 80% of that. That's the sales manager's projections. Then you take target CPA on ads. Then you times that by the sales manager projections. That's your budget. Okay? So that's how you basically spend to get to the growth you want, opposed to this, like a lot of people do this, like they're very like trying to stair step it and they're kind of scared. We just like, boom, spend right at the level that we want based on projections. Um, sales manager runs weekly one-on-ones, runs daily meetings. I recommend minimum your sales manager do three to five call reviews per week per sales rep. Okay? And ours do way more than that. I'll tell you this, like the most important thing your sales manager can be doing is literally just reviewing calls. Okay? What they're going to want to do, they're going to want to attend the, the, you know, the off-sites and talk all this strategy and then get a new CRM. They just need to do call reviews. It's just so boring that they won't want to do it. Okay? But I'm telling you, all managers, the main thing they need to do is QC. So other than that, uh, they make sure the sales reps doing their admin, communicate lead app volume and quality to marketing. So they're kind of like trying to uh, get marketing and sales to integrate together well. And then check in to respond to the end of day reports. So we're going to only have time. I'm basically almost out of time. But we're only going to have time to cover what I believe are the two biggest levers. OK, great. Uh, two biggest levers for your sales team, which is basically the daily meeting. I would say the daily meeting, it's like the centerpiece of the team. That is the 20% that drives 80% of your sales team results. OK, you'll see why in a second. So uh, most people, if I asked you guys, for a great sales team, is, sa is good sales culture important? You guys all say yes, right? Good sales culture is important for your sales team. So here's the thing. How does good culture for your sales team take place? How does it take place? Well, it can only take place when two or more people of your company are together at one time. If you run a remote company, when is the only time that's going to be? The meetings, OK? Therefore, the quality of your sales meetings is the quality of your sales culture. So you have to protect the meetings at all costs. Like, I take these, like, life or death seriously. Um, so they're daily, non-negotiable. You have to have them daily. It just creates a great rhythm for the team. Okay, I've tried to do three days a week, try to do twice a week. You got to do daily. I mean, even if, it's, even if you, you're like, man, I just need to, like, I, I, you know, I'm at this event, like, 15 minutes, you know? Just, it just it makes them show up and get prepared. They're more likely to do, the, like, their morning routine when they have the morning meeting. It, it just, it, you, you got to do it daily. 
Uh, I would do them in the mornings, but you know, sometimes you can't, so mornings is preferred, not, uh, not required. And then the cadence is we start with wins, announcements, projections, training, and then the training is either call review or we go into breakout rooms on Zoom and we do role plays, okay? Uh, we're gonna break this down step by step. Now, what is the purpose of the meetings? Obviously to build a uh, cohesive, high-performance culture, to start each day with the right energy and prime the day with wins. So you know what's funny is was I, when I was a full-time sales rep selling, I sometimes would just wake up feeling like crap, like we all do. And I would get, our meeting was so good, and I would get on the meeting, and it would like, it, the, the energy was infectious, and I would leave the meeting feeling way better than I came on, okay? So that's very, very key, okay? Uh, clarity and accountability on projections and results. So when we practice this, eventually the salespeople are gonna be able to hit their numbers uh, very accurately. So basically, our sales team, when they say they're gonna do seven, they do seven, okay? When they say they're gonna do five, they do five. They project and forecast accurately. It's not 10x, okay? It's not like, I'm hitting 10 this week. How many did you hit? Two. That doesn't fly for us, okay? It's gotta be accurate. And a big reason for this is we take their projections and feed them back into our marketing and our finance department, and that's how we budget everything. So like, their projections are not just like their personal goals. It's like, this is you know, how we're running the company here. So we, we make them very, uh, take them very seriously. One of the highest core values we have in our company is a high say-do ratio. Right, one to one, say to ratio. And then also, purpose of the meetings, train and drill your salespeople daily. Same thing as like a uh, sports team. You practice, like the best sports team when I was in high school who we played against, they, had, they literally ran three plays. And then, so they were the best team, so when I went to the all-star team, it was uh, their coach, and I was playing under their coach, like the entire practice was us literally running the same three plays. And then we, like, they, we were amazing at it because we just dr drilled the same thing every day. Your sales team's gotta be the same. Uh, so the most important part, so if, if the meeting is the 20% that drives 80% of your sales team, projections, which is how they forecast their numbers and how they actually hit it and how they commit to it, that's the 20% of the 80% meeting, meeting quality. So projections versus goals. Goals are like your targets. They can set whatever goals they want, they can 10X. I don't really care about that. What I care about is their projections. That's their bare minimum standards, okay? That's what they're gonna hit. That's the numbers they're gonna hit if shit hits the fan. So that doesn't mean that, oh my, oh my God, I'm only gonna project one this week, okay? You, you have to really like um, coach them to get them in the right, right sweet spot. The sweet spot, and I learned this from uh, Andy S. Grove, if you guys read High, High, High Output Management, it's a really good book. You want it to where if they do, like their projections need to be high enough to where if they execute the week perfectly, there's only about a 70 to 80% chance that they'll actually still hit it. That's the perfect, uh, and that's really KPIs for your entire team. That's the perfect sweet spot for really getting them to push themselves and innovate new processes, et cetera, okay? If you want them to follow up, like whose salespeople like follow up? You're like, guys, you're not following up with any of these leads. If you want them to follow up, the question is not, how do I create, like everybody always asks me, like, how do I create like the right, the, the cadence in the system for the follow up? It's not that at all, it's all a culture thing. Okay, because follow up is very easy. You, you pick up the phone and you call the person or you text the person or you email the person, very, very easy. How do you get them to do it? You create a culture where missing projections is unacceptable and then you coach them to set their projections high enough to where they cannot hit them without follow up. Now they'll do the follow-up. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, so um, we covered all that stuff, cool. So uh, another thing about the projections, it's gonna give the sales team what's called behavioral to results awareness. So every outcome that we have has constituent parts, right? There's leading indicators and lagging indicators. So what you wanna train with your entire team, especially the sales team, is you want them to get associated with when they do these actions, they get X, Y, and Z result. That's how you get them to be able to say, okay, I'm gonna project seven this week and boom, hit seven. Because they know they're gonna have this many calls, they're gonna make this amount of offers, they're gonna make this amount of outbound dials, they're gonna hit this, this amount of their pipeline. And basically over time, they're not gonna get it immediately, but like over like two, three months, they're gonna start to get it to where like, they can just kind of tell and get in this rhythm to where they start forecasting it. And then they start hitting it. That builds tremendous amounts of confidence in your sales team. When they say they can actually do something, then they do it. Like you guys know, like if you're out of shape, and you're like, man, I'm gonna wake up in the morning and I'm gonna go to the gym. If you do it, you feel really good about yourself. If you don't do it, you feel guilt. 
So it's the same thing with sales numbers. Most sales cultures are 10x, and it's like, I'm gonna hit 10 this week, I hit two. Then they feel bad about themselves, you know, they pick themselves in the next, oh, I'm gonna hit 10 this week, oh, I hit three. Right, so we wanna do it to where it's accurate every single time. Uh, only two reasons they can miss projections. Number one is a lack of accuracy. Number two is insufficient behavior slash inputs, okay? So first, they could just be inaccurate. And that's, that's very common with new people. Second is like they just didn't have the amount of leading indicators, whether that's outbound calls, offers, live calls taken, whatever it is, closing rate, to be able to hit that number, okay? So again, I put here, uh, when this system is mastered, it gives your uh, closers and your setters a feeling of control, and control lends to certainty, and certainty sells, okay? Um, now, how to actually win the meeting? We start off by sharing wins. They go into a channel in Slack, and essentially what they do is they share one to two wins. Like, they should be jumping in. On your meeting, when you start, you don't say, John, give us your win. Amy, give us your win. Similar to the group interview, you just let them all jump in. You want them all talking over each other, and you want the time in between winnings to be very, very uh, short, okay? What you don't want is, all right, guys, like, let's hear some wins, and then it's like, the deer in the headlights look on Zoom. You don't want that, okay? Uh, if my team does that, we'll end the meeting, and then you have to jump back on the meeting to actually like, do the thing correctly. It does make a huge difference. It's, it's, it's the tempo. The other thing, too, is when they, say, when they have to search for the wins, and then they have to say the wins, and they have to hear these other wins, it just is constantly reinforcing, our product gets people results, okay? It's huge. And, and the biggest thing with sales and persuasion is their conviction within the product. Um, step two is you make any necessary announcements, uh, self-explanatory. Step three is the projections. So what we'll do is we'll go around, and basically what we'll do is they'll state um, their projection for the month, their projection for the week, and then where they're at in relative to those projections. So like I'll call on John, and John will be like, I'm projecting 30 for the month, I'm at 15, I'm projecting seven for the week, I'm at two, it's on a Wednesday, I'm behind pace, and the reason I'm behind pace is I have three stacked on Monday, and only one came in, so I overhedged on that, and what I'm gonna do to make up for it is I'm gonna make this amount of outbound calls, and I'm also gonna open my Saturday so I can hit the volume on the back half of the week. Okay, so that's like, I just made that up on the top of my head. But you see how like, that communicates self-awareness. Like John, in that example, he's treating him being a salesperson as a business under my business. Like it's his book of business. Does that make sense? So you want them to have that self-awareness and that accountability, and also you want them to know the projections at all times. So if I call on John, and I'm like, John, projections, and he's like, ah, uh, let me look. And then he's like looking at another monitor. John's getting thrown off the meeting. That doesn't work, okay? He's gotta know it at all times, because the more he knows it, and the more he has association with what the projection actually is, he's gonna get better at it, right? If it's top of mind, he's gonna improve it. But if he's not even worried about it, obviously he's not gonna improve it. Does that make sense? Okay, so that sounds intense, but the meetings are super fun, believe it. Um, so we'll talk about, you know, we kinda of went through all the, yeah, so you wanna look for, is there a clear action plan? Is there self-awareness? And are they hedging their behavior, right? We want the inputs, like we wanna know inputs, outputs with the salespeople, and we wanna increase our inputs by 20% so that worst case scenario, we still hit the target. Does that make sense? Cool. So after we go through that, that takes about 20 minutes out of the hour. We want 40 minutes for, about, for training. Typically, we just do a call review every single time, or we'll break out into groups, and we'll have the sales leads do call review, okay? Then we'll open it up for questions, uh, you know, or we'll do that through the call review. And uh, common, common pitfalls, last thing. So number one, lack of responsiveness. Again, I already said that. They should be jumping in. They should know their projections. Lack of engagement. So we have a laptop only and camera on only policy, okay? Uh, sometimes we will let them log in on their phone, but they gotta be in like a quiet play. I mean, they gotta let us know in advance. Uh, there's no camera off in our company. That does not happen. Um, so another common pitfall is you doing all of the coaching. You wanna include your best people, and like you might be reviewing the call, you might stop, and you might say, John, what do you think about Sarah's call here when she did that, right? Get John coaching Sarah a little bit. Like you want some team camaraderie. Um, tolerating un uh, uh, unawareness around projections, not letting them take it seriously, we covered that, and also not making the meetings valuable. So the biggest thing is like, if your sales team is asking you, hey, 
can I not do the meeting so I can take another call? You're not doing meetings correctly. My team, when they get pulled, we have like an NPS survey that goes out to the team, they say their favorite part about working at the company is the meetings because they get so much value out of the meetings, the energy's high, and it's fun. And that's for every single department. We run almost every single department like, like what I showed you for the most part, especially fulfillment and sales, ops, ops and finance, you know, they kind of do their own thing. But especially fulfillment and sales, <laughs> we run like this. Marketing, we run like this because those are performance-based positions. Ops and finance, they, you know, they, I don't know. They can, they can tell you what they do. Um, but again, my team will say, my favorite part's the meetings. And I used to think like, your favorite part's the meetings. Like, that's so weird. Because I thought people, I was conditioned to think people hated meetings. Meetings are bad. If you do them correctly, it's like the centerpiece of your culture. Again, it's the only place culture can take, uh, take form. So it's very, very big. Um, and I think it's not only why our sales team is so good, but also like how we're able to scale so fast and build all of these departments is because we learned how to do it with the sales team, which is really hard. It's much easier to do it with your marketing team, your fulfillment team, et cetera. So that's it.